Sorry? Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's, not re it's not ready yet. That's going to be on Amazon Web Services. To you, you will be, we will run um, parallel queries on multiple servers uh, that we get from Amazon Web Services. It's cool. It's, there are extremely simple queries, but uh, the, the setup is cool. Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, it's time to start. So uh, let me start with the announcement. Um, I'm, I'm, I need to apologize for getting back and forth so much about the finals. Uh, but uh, in the end, it turns out uh, it's not unexpected. There is no good compromise. There is no time when everybody can take the final and be happy uh, taking it at that time. So what, what I will do, I will, um, I, I will go for the maximum flexibility. So uh, we are going to have the main uh, take-home final uh, uh, the weekend before the last lecture. It's going to be funny, but I, I'm going to tell you something nice in the, last, in the last lecture, so you will come anyway. Um, so, we, but you will you will be after the finals, after the finals. So you will take your main final uh, on Saturday and Sunday, um, December four and five. We will post it at midnight, and you have to turn it in by by midnight. But if you cannot make it, then uh, or if you don't like to, to take it um, on, on that date. Uh, please let me know. Uh, I need to know exactly uh, at least a, few, a couple of days before the final. Uh, and we, I, I will schedule uh, a second date, uh, probably on, on, on uh, Thursday, Friday, like we, uh, we were planning initially. It's not going to be over the weekend. It's going to be during the, the weekday, uh, probably Thursday and Friday. So I will make sure that all the, the, um, the, the, the finals are graded um, by Saturday, and the, the grades are turned in by Saturday. So I really hope that most people will be able to take the final uh, on the 4th and 5th, and only a few of you uh, will opt for, for the other option. Uh, I'm, I might reuse some of the questions. It's difficult to design to equal uh, finals. Uh, so I really trust on your maturity not to uh, share the final. Uh, I will, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what technology we will use. We will try, we, I'm cu currently considering Catalyst for administering, administering the online final. Uh, uh, but anyway, you should not share uh, uh, whatever you see with, you, with your colleagues that they have not taken it yet, because some of the problems might be reused. And I, I trust you that you won't do this. And vice versa, if you, if you take it late, then don't ask, don't ask, how was it, how, what kind of questions were. Okay, uh, I can't imagine this as being a difficult final. You have two days to think about this, uh, but I will require you to go through lots of material and, and make sure that you, you know it. Good, any questions about the final? Uh, um, then um, a short note, um, so last time we started discussing, uh, I mean we discussed XML, we discussed XPath, uh, and we stopped right before discussing X query. That's what we will discuss today in class, X query. Uh, now, in X query, they replaced uh, what used to be document, and you'll see where it disappeared. They replaced it with doc. Uh, and when you use uh, when you use the X query interpreter for homework, uh, which one? Homework six. Then you need to use doc, not document. Document doesn't work, and you don't understand why. It doesn't work because you need to use doc. So let me m now switch the slides to um, to X query. So this is um, um, uh, this is what we are going to discuss in the next like 20 minutes. Uh, the syntax for X query. Think about this as uh, the SQL language for XML. Just to re refresh our memory, XML is a three data model. Uh, it, is, it can be arbitrarily deep nested, it can be nested arbitrarily uh, deep. Uh, otherwise, it can represent data uh, as, as well as relations can represent data. Uh, the data in XML can be non-normalized. Uh, we have seen a simple uh, language called XPath that allows us to navigate through the tree structure, much like uh, the Unix directory commands 
uh, allow us to navigate in the directory um, uh, tree structure. Uh, but XPath by itself, it doesn't allow us to do joints, doesn't allow us to construct uh, new XML documents to be returned, and, um, and this is what XQuery does. I need to mention this uh, because XML QL was, this was um, um, my research group's uh, proposal. So early on when XML first appeared, uh, it was a variant of HTML, and when we looked at it, we were doing research on semi-structured data, we said, we need a query language for this, and that was the first query language, XMLQL. Uh, but we, we, we didn't pretend this, is, this to be an a industrial strength language. It took, after that, it took about seven years for, it, for the XQuery working group to, um, to define XQuery. So what is this XQuery? Uh, remember in SQL, we have select from where. In XQuery, we have for, let, where, and return. These are the, the four main clauses. And these expressions are called flower, flower expressions. So let me show you a first simple X query. Uh, here it is. So what does it say? Um, the variable X goes over bib slash book. Do you remember X pass? What does uh, slash bib slash book do? That the uh, root word starts querying. So the root, uh, what is the root element here? It's bib, and underneath it looks for books. Uh, and uh, everything that it can find, it will bind to this variable x. Once it, find, it, it binds, binds to x, then from x it will navigate and check that there is a year, and that uh, the value of that year is greater than 1995. And if so, then it will return the title of x. Very simple. So what you get uh, are results like this. Lots of titles. A very simple flower expression. And um, please remember, instead of document, you need to use docs. Also, for simple XPath expression, this is how you check. How, this is how you run XPath. You, uh, we, we, I, I started from nowhere, uh, but you need to start from the document. You say document, and then from there on, you continue with the XPath expression. Okay, um, the, same, the same query as before. We can push more, more of the computation inside XPath. And this is considered to be cool uh, XQuery style. So instead of a where clause, here is where you can put, put the condition. You can push it inside XPath. Uh, and you can actually go that all the way. So you, you don't need to, to return. You know, don't need the return clause, you can do this directly. This is the, the last line is uh, both a valid XQuery um, query and a valid XPass query. XPass, I should mention, is, a, is um, I mean, XQuery uses XPass. Everything you can write in XPass, you can write in XQuery too, but you can, you can do, uh, write more stuff. Okay, so uh, here is um, something more interesting that we can do in XQuery that we couldn't do in XPass namely create interesting results. Um, here, here is an example, it's not that interesting, but it shows you um, the, the concept. Um, again, we go to over books, and for every book X, we return a particular pattern, a particular pattern or template, sometimes they call it template. Uh, and this pattern is answer, there is a title and a year inside the answer, and what do we place in the answer? We place the title and we place here. So now what we get as, as answer is, as a result, are, are, um, is a set of answer elements. Inside each answer element, there is a title and a year. Okay? So notice, let me uh, erase this stuff. Um, notice the interesting parentheses here, the, the left braces. The left brace, what is this? What do you think is that? Substitution. Yes. So it, it's an indication that what comes after title is not a constant, but it is um, part of X query. So I actually have this on the, on, the, on the next slide. If you drop it, what will this query actually return? Yes? That, that literal string. It will return exactly this, right? So here it is. You get, actually you get one for every binding of X. That, that's what you get. Okay, 
Um, more things that you can do in uh, XQuery that you couldn't do, we couldn't do in XPath is uh, we can we can construct in, intric intricately nested uh, output XML documents. For example, here, what does it say? Um, let's read this query together. So look at uh, B is bound to bib, then A is bound to the authors in bib. And then what do we return? We return the result. But in that result, <coughs> what do we place? What, what comes first? Author. An, an author, right? And after that? Uh, titles. One or multiple? Possibly multiple titles. So this is what you get. You get, uh, you get multiple results, one for every binding of A and B. And in each in, inside each result, we get one single author and multiple, um, uh, possibly multiple titles. What, what are, actually, what are these titles? Which titles do we get? We get an author like, like, like Smith. And uh, we get several titles, but how are these titles related to the author Smith? Smith? Sorry? They're that author's titles. They are titles of, of, of Smith, right? And this is done right here. Because uh, now when we, uh, when we fetch the titles, we start again from B, look at B, B is bound to the root. So uh, actually this is my little trick. So I don't have to start from document again. So I bind, I bind B to the, to the uh, root. And then uh, we return those books uh, whose author is our A, our, our, our current author. And we get all the, the book, the, all the titles written by the current author. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, this gives us the power to restructure uh, documents and to um, essentially to re reformat them or re restructure them according to your desire. Why would you do this? Why would you start from a, one particular format and restructure the data? That physical data independence concept views, right? You can maintain some particular structure, but change the underlying data. Um, maintain, maintain a particular st structure, but... Uh, okay, so you're, you're right. This, is, this kind of defines a view. Yeah, this defines a new view over the data. Uh, but the next time we have another reason. Remember DTDs? Why, why would we use DTDs? DTDs are like, like, they describe the structure of the XML document. Who cares about the structure of the XML document? Yes? Anything that consumes it? So you can take you know, uh, your own personal XML thing and then run it through one of these to make it into the RSS DTT so you have an RSS feed from that data. Exactly. You want to give this document to some application that consumes it, to some, some consumer. And that consumer only accepts documents in a particular uh, with a particular structure, with a particular DTD. Uh, and here, XQuery allows you to uh, construct that output structure, that, that DTD. It allows you to restructure your document to conform to the output DTD. Uh, in homework, uh, oh, now I start getting confused, homework six, which is XQuery, uh, you are allowed to answer 10 simple queries. And for each of them, uh, Param gave you the DTD. He wants you to, to uh, produce the answer exactly according to that DTD. By the way, I forgot to mention, the, the X square interpreter that we use is called Zorba. Uh, it's free. You can download it from the web. Uh, and uh, it, is, um, uh, it comes from Oracle. It's actually implemented by somebody I, I know. She was a, a um, co-author of, uh, of mine on, on the XML QR, uh, query. Uh, Dana Florescu, uh, she uh, spent uh, the last 10 years working on XQuery and um, implementations of XQuery. She actually had a company that was bought by, um, uh, by BEA, and um, you know, now she ended up at Oracle. So she, she's an expert in XQuery, and uh, I, I found this to be a cute interpreter. Uh, before that, we had Galax, uh, which was uh, a, a, um, also a free interpreter, but it's no longer supported. Uh, so we don't have Galax anymore. Uh, Zorba seems to be quite efficient. 
How many people have tried Zorba? Okay, not, not too many. Uh, if you use Windows, it's trivial. It just goes a binary, you get the binary and it runs. Uh, if you use a Mac like I do, uh, I, I think I told you this several times, it took me half a day to install it. So um, plan ahead. Good, so here is the result of uh, the previous query. Um, more about X query. Uh, we have aggregate, and they're actually used in a much more uh, simple fashion than in SQL. An aggreg aggregate is really a function that we apply to a list. For example here, X is bound to a book, and that book might have several authors. The expression X slash author returns a list, a list of all the authors of the current book. And count is applied to this, this list and tells us how many authors there are. And it returns books that have uh, more than three authors. Uh, so we have count, average, sum, distinct values. Distinct values is interesting. Let me show you uh, distinct values, but not this one, let me skip here. Distinct values also takes a list uh, and it does exactly what you expect. It elim eliminates duplicates. Now that list must be uh, a list of atomic values. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't want to mess around with uh, finding out whether two XML uh, subtrees are, are equal and have to be du uh, one of them has to be eliminated. So it really uh, insists that uh, you give it a list of atomic values. And then it will eliminate duplicates and that's what you, um, what you can, that's, that's what you can do. So here, the only interesting piece here is that it, uh, this query finds all authors, but of course one author might occur multiple times. Distinct values, distinct values eliminates duplicates. And now you get a, uh, a, a list of where every author occurs only once. This is like the typical usage of uh, uh, regrouping. You first construct a, a unique, a distinct list of all the um, distinct values and then you iterate over it. Okay, more about restructuring. There are actually two patterns to restructuring. Uh, one is flattening. You have a nested structure and you, you flatten it. And the other is the opposite, nesting. So let's see flattening first. So here, remember we have, um, and our, our tree looks like this. We had bib. Under bib we have books, we have books, and every book has one title and multiple authors. So it is nested in the order, uh, authors are under books. Uh, what, this, what this does, it flattens them. It, 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 lists, it lists them like a, in, a, in a flat set of uh, book title, comma, author pairs. So here is how we do it. Um, X iterates over the title, and Y iterates over the authors. And for each such pair, we produce um, one uh, title author answer. So uh, what happens if you have a book with, uh, if you, what happens if your database consists of a single book with three authors? How many answer elements do you get? You have uh, one single book uh, which has a title and three authors. How many answer elements do you get? Three. Three, three right? What are these three answers? The first is, consist, the first contains the title and, and one author. The second contains the same title and the second author. Good. What happens if you have uh, just one single book, three authors, but it has two titles? Two titles, three authors. What do we get? Six. You get six results because now X iterates over a set of two titles and why it reads over a set of three authors, and you get all possible combinations. What happens if you have three titles and no authors? What do we get? Nothing. Then you get nothing. You get three times zero. So uh, you, you, got, you got the idea. This is, this is uh, so what happens is the for clause 
he said you get all the combinations of variable bindings and you have to figure out how they uh, how they interact any questions about this good uh, the, the opposite is nesting or or regrouping so what we do here is that we, we reverse the hierarchy instead of having uh, books title author 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 we have now we will have now an uh, an author and underneath we have all all his books actually all, all the titles okay so how can we do this well first we need uh, the list of all distinct authors that we get from here this is the, the first thing we do. We have a, a list of all the distinct authors. Authors, no duplicates. Otherwise, we get the same author twice. And, and then, uh, for every author X in this list A, uh, we create one answer, where we, we, we uh, plug in the name of the author. And now, we need to find all these books, right? Because we need, want to list all the book titles next to the author name. So we, we start again from, from the root, from, from bib. And we look, uh, this is where we do the join. Uh, we uh, match <coughs> for the current author, and we return the title of the book. Where's the title tags coming from on that? Ah, so that's, uh, let me actually erase this and, and ask you this. What is this why? What kind of, uh, this is bound to what kind of node? Every variable must be bound to either a list of, of nodes or to one single node. The title? This is bound to a title, exactly. So therefore, when we, when we return here, we get to actually get a title, we get a, a, a title element. And that includes the open title and the closed title tags around the title of the book? Yes. And maybe a better way to think about this is that uh, it is bound to an, a node in this, the XML data, data um, data model and, and that note when you print it when you then you have to print begin tag the con everything underneath and then end tag so this is the, these titles here each each of these elements is represents one binding of dollar y okay so uh, what's more about regrouping so what's the difference here I can't figure out the difference. Oh, oh, oh. So here, uh, the difference is we, we didn't have A. We, yeah, it's, it's a minor difference. I don't know why I kept two slides. Ignore it. Good. So now let's, uh, let's take a, a, a higher level look. Uh, this is like the second query language that we study. We study like SQL for three <coughs> for three hours and X query for um, 15 minutes. So let's compare them. Uh, here is, uh, on the left, we have a simple SQL query. It does a simple selection from product. Now remember we discussed last time, there is a canonical uh, representation of, uh, uh, of every relation into XML, where, where every row becomes a row element and its, its fields become uh, Add, become sub elements with the, with the corresponding name. Under that representation, we can uh, express the same query on, on, that we have in SQL, we can express it in X query. So let's see it. It's right here. It's, it's trivial. So here is how it goes. Uh, we go to the database, uh, we go to the product element. Under this product element, we have many, many rows. And X will be bound to every row. And then what we need to do? Uh, we need to uh, return um, its name and price because this is what we need to return here. Notice that we have an order by uh, in SQL and we can do exactly the same thing in, in next query. We can order by. Okay, so that was a simple comparison. Here is a, um, a more complicated um, a query that doesn't join. So um, here we want to return 
all, all uh, product names of all the products that are made by a company in Seattle. So let's see this in, in, in X. Where is there is a, in a, a, a trivial uh, direct translation from SQL and into X query. Uh, the, the X and Y in, in SQL, oops, what did they do? X and Y in SQL, they become dollar $X and dollar $Y in X query. So X was a product, uh, therefore dollar $X will iterate over the product rows, and Y will iterate over the company rows. Uh, and here we have a join. Look, the join is right here. We make sure that the maker is equal to CID. And city is equal to Seattle, and then we return the name. It's a very simple analogy. Now, uh, this is like a, a, this is a lame, uh, a lame X query. Let me show you a, 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 a cool X query. It's right here. That's a cool X query. You, you try to push as much as possible of the joints if you want to write cool X query. You don't write where uh, uh, clauses. You, you push as, my, as much of the predicates inside the X pass expression. So uh, what happens now is that when you, when you iterate over a company, you can already uh, select only, only the companies that are in Seattle. And now uh, when you iterate over the products, you don't uh, select all of them, but you return only the products that I'm, are made by Y, by the company Y. And that's cool X query. And the, here is a, the result. Okay, more comparison, um, aggregate. Um, so, so SQL, if you, uh, one thing to remember about SQL is that it treats ag aggregates in a very unique way, in a non-standard way. And no other programming language today uh, treats aggregates that way. The reason why SQL insists in doing this is because uh, aggregates are, first of all, very frequent. And written this way, they can be optimized much better. They can be recognized and optimized much better. Uh, in X query, we are back to, um, um, to uh, this traditional way of doing aggregates, which means nested, nested loops. I actually tried to convince here the, the working group at some point to, to adopt a SQL-like uh, uh, group I. Uh, but they didn't, didn't take my, 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 my proposal, so we are stuck. Uh, uh, un, 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 unless they, they add an, an extension, we are stuck with this more verbose way of, of dealing with aggregates. So let's look at this. Uh, what does it do? Uh, it lists for every company the number of products that that company makes. Uh, look how easy. Uh, how easy this is in, in, in SQL. We just do the join, and then we group by. Um, the, the company, right? And, the, and once we group, then we can count. Now in X query and in any a normal programming language except SQL, uh, you do this by having a second iteration that does a count. And here it is. Uh, first we iterate over all the companies. And now for every company, for every company here, we need to count. So how do we count? Well, um, right here. You start again from the root. And you look at for all the products that, that match your company and that have the whatever select, whatever additional constraints they must have, and you count them. The problem is not that it's longer. The problem with this query is that it's, it's more difficult for the optimizer to recognize it as a group I. That, that, that's the issue. Uh, once, once the optimizer recognizes the query is a group I, it can optimize it better. Uh, and here is a, uh, it's actually difficult for me to make the point, but uh, in, the, uh, on the, in the first lecture when we discussed text query, I showed you, um, uh, and, uh, when we discussed SQL, I showed you a SQL query with, with group I and the corresponding one with uh, uh, nested queries. And that has an implicit join. Even if you start with a single table and you do a group I, if you replace uh, the group I with, with, an, um, um, uh, with a subquery, then you have an implicit join. Depending on where you place con the conditions, you get variations of that query, and only one of them is equivalent to the group I. So the optimizer has a hard time figuring out that that nested query is actually a group I query. And I, I hope we will come back to this point when we discuss uh, uh, query processing. 
it's, it's really, it's, it's, um, it's not an elegant um, construction because it's limited. You can't do nested, nested aggregates this way. But it's a, it's a major insight in the, in the SQL framework that allows uh, an important class of queries to be optimized very efficiently. Good, so let's continue the discussion of uh, X query. Uh, let me skip this slide. Uh, this makes it the distinction between for and let, but I have a better slide for that. So let me move to, which comes, that's actually right here. Um, so uh, I have two more slides on X query, but this is an important idea that I want to make here. We have seen uh, usages of four. We say four dollar X in something. And this means iterate X over every single uh, element in the list. This, this has to be a list. And what, this, what the fourth, uh, uh, fourth statement does, it, um, it introduces it a, a loop. And then at every step of the loop, it binds X to one of the elements in the list. There is a second construction called let, which looks like, like this. Let Y equals something. It's, it's a completely different construction. This does not create uh, an iteration. It simply takes the expression on the right and assigns it to Y. It's like a shorthand. You can, you can always remove it. If you ever get confused about the distinction, come back to this slide. This, will, this is the aha uh, uh -huh slide. So, so here it is. Um, we, have, um, we have a collection of books. And the first query says for x in these books, return this result. The second says, let x be this collection of book and return this result. So here is a difference. In the first case, the return statement is fired once for every book. So you get a different result, um, a different result for, uh, for every book. In the second statement, the return statement, uh, statement is fired only once uh, because there is no iteration introduced here. And therefore, we get only one single result with all the books inside because X is bound now to, to a list of books. Okay, uh, so that's all I have to, to tell you about X query. Uh, it's really a, it's a simple and cute language. It's a, essentially, it's a functional programming language, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a good substitute for a query language. It became a little bit richer than it should be, uh, but it's, 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 it really it serves its, its purpose well. It's the query language for, for X query. Uh, you just learn it. You, um, you do these 10 exercises for the homework, and then you'll know X query. It's not a big deal. I think it's, it's briefly described in the book. Uh, but the slides plus a book plus whatever help you can get from the web should be enough. OK. It's OK to move to the, uh, to the next to topic. Good. So then today I'm going to start discussing, um, um, uh, discussing um, data storage. Uh, indexes and database tuning. Uh, so here is my plan for today. Uh, storage and indexing are covered in, in <coughs> chapters 8, 9, and 10, so please um, uh, read about them. I also want to talk about database tuning, which is covered in chapter 20. And I will not talk about security. But you do have uh, some questions about database security on the uh, fifth homework. Uh, so please read either these slides, which are on, on the, in the slide deck, uh, or read the corresponding chapter on the, in the book, in the textbook. The slides were, uh, when, I, when I wrote these slides several years ago, I wrote them using this textbook. I use, uh, I use um, Ramakrishnan and Gerke textbook. So you can use either the slides or the textbook in the, the equivalent. Good. So um, regarding the first two topics, I'm going to start discussing storage and indexing. But then I'm going to, to switch, to, to skip some material, and move to database tuning. Because you, uh, you have a question on database tuning in the homework, and it's due next week. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think I, I'm going to finish indexing today. Uh, I'm we are going to postpone the detailed discussion of B-trees and of hash tables for next time. Good. 
So let's start uh, actually slowly uh, discussing the storage model uh, in, in, um, um, for database systems. Of course, they don't need to store these tables somewhere, right? So where, where do the tables go? They go in files. They are being stored on, uh, on disk in, in files. But they are not your regular files. It's not the case that one table is one file. Uh, and this is because a database management system needs more control over how the data is stored on disk than uh, you normally need. When you, when you use Word or, or Emacs to, to, to write a little file or Excel, then uh, the file is what you see in the operating system and you can copy it, you can do whatever you want with it, and that's fine for that application. Not so for a database management system. It needs to have more control over how the data is, um, um, is, is organized. And you can think about this control as being in two dimensions. There is spatial control. It needs to know where the data is stored, and it needs to have control over where the data is layout, laid out on disk so it can improve performance. And then there is temporal control. It needs to know exactly when the pages are being forced to, to disk or when they are being pinned in main, in main memory uh, because of all the uh, transaction, uh, manage, um, transaction issues that we discussed in so many details. So that is the, um, um, the temporal control. So what do database systems do? Uh, they need to use uh, files, but they, they don't use files directly. Uh, there are two strategies. One is uh, the using raw disks. This means that when you install your database system, you say, this disk is yours. I'm not going to use it for anything else. And then the database system takes over that disk and it does whatever it wants uh, with it. So the advantage is that uh, it can get the highest performance. It can, it can organize the entire disk exactly how it wants. Nobody else accesses that disk. And that's the highest performance. Uh, the disadvantage is if you have, if you have, um, you know, your, your laptop with only one disk, you can't do this, right? You, you, can't, you don't want to give your entire disk to the database system because you still need the operating system, you still need to log in, you still need to use Word. Um, and, and moreover, um, it is also, it reduces portability. Uh, okay, that's all I want to say about this. The other option is to use an operating system file. But even here, uh, it's, not, it's not the case that every table becomes one file. Instead, what database systems do, they uh, grab a huge file to start with. Uh, I just finished installing Postgres uh, on my laptop um, this afternoon, and that's what it does. It, it asks you, where, where, where should I store my database? And you give it uh, this directory. Uh, it's quite, quite, quite protected. It, it doesn't want you to, to look inside. Uh, and somewhere there is a big file that you shouldn't look at. And this is where the database is. Um, so in that file, uh, since it allocates a huge chunk uh, to begin with, it has more spatial control. It can do whatever it wants. Uh, but there are some disadvantages. Uh, the operating system might limit the size. Uh, I'm not sure about the second one. Uh, it might limit uh, the number of open file descriptors. Uh, so there are, there are some disadvantages for doing this. It's okay to do for your little toy application on your, on your laptop, but it's not, not okay for, to do for an um, industrial strength database system. You have a comment? I, I think that MySQL actually does write like two files per table. Um, so one, one, one for indexes and one for the, the main data. They don't use one huge file. That's, for, that's true for the MySQL tables, but InnoDB has one giant massive file. Oh, all right, cool. And you stick your index in arbitrary places on Oracle. So, for instance, you have a bunch of data files on one spindle, and then another one has the indexes for those files. Okay, so if, if you didn't hear at Microsoft, the discussion here was that my MySQL uh, has two options uh, InnoDB, and the other is? Uh, my ISM is the default. My ISM. My, my, my ISM. My ISM. I, I never really remember this. It's the default one that doesn't support transactions, it's not used in the industry for that reason. I see. So the one that uses files. The one that uses individual files for tables. Okay. So under these two options, uh, um, one, in one of them, every table is mapped to a file, and in the other one, the entire database is mapped to a single file. And of course, the second one is, um, is, is better users, it supports transactions, and it's, yeah, it's a better option. Okay. So now, 
so let me skip this. The mostly, most commercial systems, they, uh, they offer you both um, choices. Um, so what happens inside that, this space that, that is allocated for, for the database system? Uh, at this point, the database system is free to, to call whatever it, uh, wherever it stores the table, it's going to call that a file. Wherever it stores an index, it's going to be a file. But it, it's not necessarily an operating system file. This might be a file inside the space that it controls. This file, uh, from the perspective of the database system, is organized in one of two ways. It can either be a heap file or a sequential file. Heap means just collection of records, no guarantee about uh, what and what order they come. And sequential file means there is, there is one attribute called the key, and the records are sorted according to this key. And be careful, we are going to use key many times in this, in this lecture, and uh, none of them represent the primary key, and none of them, they are actually not even equivalent. Uh, so this is a key of the sequential file. It doesn't mean uh, the primary key. OK, so, um, so what happens on disk? So the disk is partitioned into blocks. And um, the, the, database sees a, the, the, the database system sees a disk as a collection of these blocks. They have fixed size. Uh, it knows where they are. It, it can read one block at a time. Uh, but now it needs to decide how to uh, map the, the tables and the files to blocks. And one thing to keep in mind when, when discussing this mapping is that uh, sequential reads from disks are much more efficient than random accesses. If you can read uh, consecutive blocks, uh, uh, many consecutive blocks at the same time, it's much more efficient than trying to read the same number of blocks from different, uh, from different places on, on disk. Okay, so what I want to show you in the next few slides uh, are simple ideas, but I think it's, we need to go over them. Uh, namely, how, um, how blocks are organized on disk, how uh, records are organized inside blocks, and how it fields or attributes are organized inside the records. And um, just to keep some, some example in mind, I'm going to use this example here. It's not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use it in a critical way, but uh, imagine a table uh, where we have four attributes. So that's what you should look, look, look for. Where do the records consisting of these four attributes, where do they end up on disk? That's a question to ask. So the, uh, there are three issues. Uh, one is managing, I wrote here free, but it should be managing blocks, both the free blocks and the blocks that are not free. Uh, how, how, how do we imagine, manage them? Uh, packing records inside blocks and, and packing attributes or representing attributes inside the records. So let's see how we deal with blocks. Uh, the free blocks, the blocks that we can grab when we need more, more space, uh, they can either be uh, linked, and you have a pointer to the beginning of the list, and then you, gra you grab that block when you need it, and then you update the pointer. Uh, or we can have a bitmap. Right, so, so the blocks, um, a list of free blocks looks like this. Here is one block, like um, um, 16K, and somewhere here there is a pointer to another block. And it says this is free, and here we have a pointer to, the, to another block. This is free. Bitmap uh, means the following. Here are all the blocks on your disk from zero to a very large number. Uh, and somewhere uh, on a special place on, on the disk, you keep an array of bits. where there is one bit for every block. And here you see ones and zeros. One means it's occupied, me zero means it's free. Um, this is not a rule, you can reverse it, but I think it's a reasonable convention. Okay, so now, if I need a free block, in the first case, what do I do? <coughs> I, I need to insert an, an element and there is no more room, I need a, a new block to insert that element. Where do, I get, where do I get it from, in the first case? From the head of the, of the linked list. So I, I just grab this block, this is going to be my block where I put it, and I update the pointer of the, um, uh, of the list to the next one. Very simple. 
And of course, when you, when you free a block, you do the opposite. You put it as the beginning of the list. But if we have a bitmap representation, I need a free block. What do I do? Look, look for a zero, uh, and this tells you where, where to go. And this is your block that you grab. And you, of course, you update this now to one. Uh, how will you compare the two? Which one is, well, what are the, the advantages and disadvantages? Yes? First way is much faster because you don't have to scan through. The first one is it's much faster. You just get the, the, free, is the free block. What's the advantage of the second one? Is there an advantage? You can get contiguous blocks. You can get contiguous blocks, exactly. Maybe, maybe you know you need to uh, you, you create a table and the user to told you um, I need 500 gigabytes. Right, and you look for 500, con you, you, you try to optimize this. Maybe you don't find 500 uh, consecutive, uh, you don't find 500 gigabytes worth of consecutive blocks, but you, you can optimize this. Yes? Oh, I was just thinking that in the case of needing 500 gigs, uh, as long as you get blocks of sufficient size, like 10 blocks at a time, then you might get a 9% uh, solution on that and not worry about it. Right, so you don't you don't need the entire uh, the entire file to be contiguous, but you would, you would like large chunks in this file to be contiguous, and this is where the bitmap uh, helps you, because now you have a, a full a complete picture of the free space on your disk, and you can you have more control where you uh, which block you are allocate you allocate. Yes. So when it is allocating contiguous blocks in the bitmaps, how does it know that okay this is the next block for this particular block? How does it know the next sequence in the particular block? Oh, I, yeah. And so how, how do I, if I need the 10, 10 zeros, how do I find my 10 zeros in this block? Yes. I guess, I guess you, just, you just scan through it. You, you, you scan sequentially until you look for 10 consecutive zeros. Or you might do something where you look for zeros, like treat it as a byte array and just look for zeros. You get eight and that's good enough. So, I mean, after eight, so it has Nine would be maybe not in the next one. So does it use a pointer to, to the ninth one? So you, are, are you asking about the physical representation of the bit array? Yes. Okay. So how is that uh, represent? I I don't think there is a rule, but we can we can discuss it a little bit. Obviously, you pack uh, eight bits into a byte, and actually thirty-two bits in a word. Uh, and obviously, these, the, 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 this bitmap has to be on disk. So you probably have set aside a number of blocks. Uh, and you can do the math, you know exactly how many blocks you need, uh, where you are going to, uh, which, which are reserved for this, uh, for um, the, the, the bitmap uh, for the entire disk. Uh, so think about this as being here at the end, All right? because I don't have room at the beginning. So this is where your bitmap is. So you read this in main memory, uh, it should fit, it better fit. Uh, and. Um, uh, now you just do sequential scan through this, yeah. right? You, you have to unpack the bits, which is something you can do easily in C, um, C, C sharp, uh, less easily maybe in Java. Yes. Are the blocks in bitmap of same size? The, all the blocks are of the same size. That's an invariant. Of not all. No, no. Uh, what you can do when you when you initially format the disk. Then you can decide on the on the size of your block. So if I use a part of a block, I, I cannot declare the rest of it as a list. Exactly. If you oh. use only a part of the block, it's your job. I mean, the, it's a database a system's job to decide how to organize a block. Which brings us to the next question. Actually, we didn't get there yet. Let's see first. Uh, so uh, let's see first. No, this is this is orthogonal. The linked list is orthogonal to how how you organize and size a block. I only showed you here. What what I showed you on this slide is how to deal with the free blocks. When you when you need, when you need a completely empty block, this is how you think about it. That works by the bitmap as a linked list of blocks of bits. Okay, so let's let's discuss how uh, uh, blocks that belong to different tables are organized. 
Uh, well, uh, same, same idea. You can either link them. So uh, if this is a header page, whatever that means, uh, then all the useful pages can be linked, like here. And maybe all the um, separate you have pages that, or, or blocks that have some free space, and they're linked here. Uh, and you can move back and forth. But a better organization is when you have a complete picture, when you have a header for the entire table that tells you where the blocks uh, of this table are. So re remember our little example when you, have, when you need five gigabytes of, of uh, main memory? Uh, maybe you get this in chunks of, uh, let's say, eight contiguous blocks. Then uh, this is information that you, can, you, you, you might store here. You might, you might have in this header uh, all the information about how these blocks are grouped on disk. So when you have to, to do a sequential, a sequential read, you should know exactly uh, how to optimize that sequential read. Do you see the distinction? When you, when you write programs, when you, write, when you design data structures in any, uh, in any programming language, you, this is your mindset. You store things in lists because that's the cleanest design. It's easy to insert, delete. Um, that, that's how you maybe organize this in, in, in trees, but they are, they are simple structures. Uh, since data sits on disks, uh, it, it's actually more convenient for, uh, for the database system to have a global picture of where the elements in the list reside. That is a header. Uh, such that it can access, it can, for, for example, it, this allows it to go directly to the middle of the file. Something you know, it's difficult to do in, with a list. If you have a list, you might have a pointer at the beginning, one at the end. How do you get to the middle? Uh, with this organization, you have a complete picture of where all the blocks are, and you can get to any part of the, uh, of the file. Uh, why would you go there? Maybe you need to insert, and uh, the header tells you uh, which blocks have how much empty space. And then you can optimize a little bit your insert. Maybe you want to fill the, you maybe you want to, to choose the block that's more empty and put the record over there. Good. So this is how um, um, how we deal with uh, uh, blocks. So I should have started actually with this slide. Um, blocks or pages they, are, they, are, they have fixed size. Uh, I don't know where I get the eight kilobyte size. How, how big are they in Windows? Is it 16? Yeah, you can set it to whatever you feel like. But when you buy it out of the box, Windows system. Oh, well, those are four, but the database is usually configured explicitly. OK. Anybody knows for sure? In, in Windows, blocks are, are four, four kilobytes? Good. Um, I, I heard 16 for some database system, but I don't remember which one. Um, OK, so now let's discuss, uh, let's discuss uh, records, how the records are packed into blocks. And records can be of fixed lengths or of variable lengths. And we'll discuss uh, the implications of this. Uh, and one important um, concept here is that every record will have a unique ID, uh, which is called a record ID. Usually, it's, it's a physical ID. It's a, an ID that consists uh, of the page number, the block number, that allows you to get immediately to the place of the disk where you get that record. And then there is a, a, a pointer inside the block, the slot number, that tells you how to find the record inside the block. Right? This is here, the record ID. Why do we need a record ID? We have primary keys. And th that's what we learned when we studied functional dependency, when we did entity relationship diagrams and functional dependencies. Uh, we discussed every table must have a primary key. Why now introduce record IDs? Who needs to fetch records from disk? There, there is a particular uh, place that we studied uh, that needs to have uh, access to records, rec rec which is a log. Especially in the undo law, in the Aries undo part of the log, this is when it needs to refer to uh, particular records, and it has to do so 
uh, through record IDs. Uh, but it can also be used as an optimization for foreign keys, for example. When you have a foreign key, uh, of course you can store the foreign the key, the key value, which is a semantic value. Uh, but if you want to optimize it, you might store instead of the key value, you might store the record ID. Using the record ID, you can immediately um, get the, the record. Yes? This record ID is different from the page LSN that we studied in the Page LSN, yes. Uh, the, the page LSN is uh, a pointer from the page to the log entry. The record ID refers to an, a smaller entity, so it refers to a record inside the page. You yeah, might have multiple records, and uh, the, the, the record IDs will differ by the slot number. And it's a pointer that allows you to re refer to a record, as opposed to referring to a, a log entry. Okay, so let's see how we organize um, records in, in a disk. Very easy. We just pack records inside the block as densely as we can. Uh, we, we need to know how many there are. So somewhere in the block there is a number that tells us we have so many records. And here are the records. Uh, number one, number two. Remember our little product table? Each record from that product table is one record here. Good. So now if you want to insert uh, a new record, what happens? What do you do? The Sorry? You scan all the way to the end. You, you need to know where this is somehow. If the records have, have fixed lengths, then you can compute it based on n. Otherwise, you need this information. Uh, and then you just put it here, right? Now, if you want to delete a record, I want to de delete record two. What do I do? What do I do if I have to delete record two? Of course, this has to disappear, right? So how do I reclaim the space? We can shift, uh, or we can we can be smarter, a little bit more efficient. We can take the last one and move it here if, uh, if that that saves the shift if they, if they are fixed lengths. Now, uh, in what we said, insert, insertion and deletion, there is a big problem. What's a big problem? We have a big problem with this plan. And lot of size. I, I'm, uh, uh, there is a logical problem. So the, the, suppose the size is fixed. Uh, if the size is variable, then we have additional problem. I realize this. Uh, but suppose the size is fixed, and we just insert and delete uh, as we did here. Yes? Your records come unordered? Yes, that's the problem. So the, the, the uh, it's, it's, more, it's, not, it's not about the logical order. It's about the fact, look at record number three. Somebody points to record number three. Remember the record ID? That says, go to block B, record number three. So now if you shift them, because you have deleted, what, what does this record become? It becomes number two. And all over the database, we have pointers to it. And in the log, there are pointers to it. They say number two, number three. But now it became number two, and we are in trouble. We can't do this. So how will you organize it better? What if you uh, have an indirection at the block level or somewhere around there? So it says, go to block B, you know, uh, this thing, and then you just update a uh, you know, pointer in the same block when you rewrite it. Exactly. So we do it with another. Somebody said this, that every problem in computer science can be solved with, a new, new, with another level of indirection. So that's exactly the solution. We have another level of indirection, which is right here. Uh, something happened to my slide. I don't, I don't think there was anything. Uh, can you see? I'm guessing it was ah. Sorry? I'm guessing it's Good. Uh, so this is what we do. Uh, we introduce some slots at the beginning. They are just pointer inside the, inside the block. They are small pointers. We only need uh, uh, how many? Two bytes to point inside the block. So now, if you have to remove one, you can shift things around, uh, but the slots they become they stay there. 
okay, wait a minute, what happens if I need to remove, um, I want to remove this record, which means if I trace it back to this lot. Now we just, uh, we just move the problem around. Now, how do I remove the slot? Can I remove that slot? No. Uh, and that is a problem. I mean, it, 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 it stays a problem. Uh, instead of removing the slot, uh, what database systems do is they introduce a tombstone. So they put a special marker here and say, uh, this is gone. Don't, don't write. Uh, and it stays there. It stays there until the, the block is, is collected and reused and, and reshuffled. So if you, have, if you have a lot of insertions and deletions inside the database, you might end up with many, uh, many of these tombstones. And then some restructuring is, is in order. Okay, now, yes? This restructuring, to, you know, to reclaim that tombstone kind of record, happens only when the database is uh, I think there, there are commands for, for cleaning up. I, I, Even I though the data is there, the data. Yes. the data is still live. The yeah, yeah. Uh, now, if you can do this while the database is, can you do this in part of the transaction? I, I'm not sure. I, I think this is uh, vendor specific. But there are, there are ways to reorganize, there are commands for reorganizing the data. And why, exactly what they do, I, 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 I would know. Okay, so now let's look inside the records. Uh, now records, can, they can be, they are of two kinds. There are either fixed length records, when you're lucky that when all the attributes in your record have fixed lengths, then you know exactly every record how long it is, or they can be variable lengths. But of course, if they are fixed lengths, then it's trivial. Then uh, we know the length of each field. And if you want to uh, access, for example, uh, um, descriptor, description. Then you just need to add, uh, to add up the length of the previous two fields and you know exactly where to go. You go to description. You, you can compute the offset of every, of every field by summing up the other offsets. Where do you get that data from? Where is that information stored uh, that tells you the length of every uh, physical record? It's, right, it's written on the slide, right? It's in the systems catalog. This is where you have information about each table, uh, what, uh, what is, what's the schema. And in addition to the schema, there is physical information about how the data is organized on disk, including uh, offsets of every byte. So note the importance of schema information. And remember the distinction to XML. In XML, all the schema information is interleaved with the data. Very interesting uh, contrast. Okay, now if the records are of variable lengths, then it's exactly what you expect. Uh, you can do a one minor optimization, and database system, as far as I know, do this optimization. They move the fixed length attributes at the beginning, so those can be de dealt with a little bit more efficiently. And for the others, uh, you just need to, to uh, what am I showing you? Um, this is the variable length. For the others, you just uh, you, you have another level of indirection. There, is, there are some uh, uh, pointers in the header that point you to the beginning of each uh, field. So that's a typical structure of a record. It is um, uh, there is a header of the record uh, that has um, that contains the lengths. Uh, it contains pointers to, uh, to the uh, beginning of the, the, the fields that are, are after the, the fixed, fixed length fields. And then there is more information, which is on the other, um, the other table. There is a pointer to the schema entry, so we can, we can retrieve information from there. There is a sync. What's the timestamp? Excuse me. What's the timestamp? Why do we need a timestamp? You should know this. Of course we need a timestamp for every record. Because? You're doing transactions and uh, verification. 
because the, some concurrency control mechanism, the, the optimistic ones, they need a timestamp for every single element, for every single um, uh, record or, or, um, or, or block, depending on whether they do logical or, or physical uh, locking. That's why we need a timestamp. Remember time, uh, snapshot isolation? When a transaction uh, starts reading under snapshot isolation, you ha always have to return the records with that timestamp or with the timestamp that corresponds to that transaction. Uh, so you need that information a lot. You might have several copies of the same record and with different timestamps. Good. So, so much about uh, the physical organization. Let me actually go back. Uh, one thing that I didn't emphasize is this. Uh, where is it? This one here. So this is a block. And inside this block, we place many records. But what happens if the record is bigger than the block? Yes? Two blocks. Sorry? Two blocks. You can use two or three blocks. But actually, database systems, they don't like this. Uh, they, usually, um, um, they usually reject it. Uh, SQL Server has a limit. Uh, Oracle has a limit, and pretty sure DB2 has a limit too. Uh, uh, and the limit is, uh, is essentially dictated by the size of the block. You can't exceed, in a record, you can't exceed the length of the size of the block. Uh, be because otherwise the performance might degrade and you don't understand why. Uh, I'm actually using now uh, Postgres for a, for a research project and I had to create, um, um, I had to create some fields that were 10,000 uh, bytes long because the data was extracted from the web from, for some bizarre reasons. Uh, and it took it. So I suppose Postgres um, allows records to be bigger than the size of the block. Uh, surprise. Uh, but I know for sure that uh, co commercial database systems, they don't allow you to do this uh, for, for per performance reasons. If you need to do this, there is a particular type uh, which is called a blob. It stands for binary large object. It's an attribute. Uh, you can store an attribute uh, in your record. You can have an attribute in the record, in your record, which is of type blob. Uh, and usually this is physically stored in a different place. There is a pointer in the record to the corresponding blob, and this can be as big as you want. It can be um, arbitrarily big. There is a variation called CLOB, which stands for character large object. Uh, and if you promise it's going to be um, a, a, a full of characters, then SQL uh, is willing to do some searches inside. You can, you can uh, use some limited predicates in SQL, um, in, 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 in the SQL where clause. Uh, if, you, if your field is a blob, then you, you can't use any predicates uh, inside SQL. Okay. Yes. So um, the, the the data type of SQL, the one that's called like nvar char max, does that actually use a character large object? Who knows what nvar char max is? I don't know what it is. But does anyone the know? The largest bar char you can have, probably. Is is it a type or is it a a, 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 like constant? a constant? It's a constant. It's a type. It's Unicode bar char. Oh, it's Unicode. Good. I see. So, so you abandoned Unicode Varchar. And uh, the, the max is actually, there is a max. There is actually a cap to how big it can get. Oh, there is, oh so that's a constant, right? It's, it's a, a configuration value, it looks like. OK. So it's not really a, it's not really a character large object. Like that. It's, just, it's not what? It's it, not really a character large object. Like it's a SQL Server thing. I think we have to 4,000. So that fits with the 8K block size, right? Right. So, so uh, no, actually, uh, I think it's 16K. No, if it goes to 4,000, it should be 16K. Oh, okay. This one says you can only have car char up to that 4,000 then. Okay. So, so this is a limitation on the on the types that are in the record on, on bar charts. This is not a limitation on blobs. Blobs can be uh, large, can be arbitrarily large, unless there is something wrong with the database. I think about blobs as movies or, or pictures or um, anything large. Uh, the, the limitation is what you can do with the blobs. Uh, with all the other attributes, you can, you can compare them, you can join them, you can uh, filter on them. 
with blocks, you, there is nothing you can do. You just return them to the application. That, that's the difference. Uh, and the, for that reason, the data, database system stores the blobs in a different place uh, because it only needs to access them when it knows that they have to be returned to the application. Good. So let me uh, move on. All this was very simple, actually, uh, and I'm not plan planning to go any deeper in, into the physical um, organization of data. Um, so let me just summarize. Uh, the, the files that we discussed can be of two types, uh, uh, random order or heap files, uh, which means the records, as they are packed in blocks uh, and, and, and ordered um, across blocks, they, they don't come in any, with any guaranteed order. Uh, they can be sorted or sequential um, access, which means um, there is a particular attribute and the records come ordered according to that attribute. And there is a third kind of file, which are indexes. And these are special files that have a special structure that allows us to do quick searches inside the database and inside uh, uh, tables. And that's what I would like to uh, discuss in more details. But I, I see here that I have more, more slides about the physical organization. Let's, let's go, go quick, quickly over this. Oh, yeah, I have three, three more slides. We, d we didn't discuss it, maybe, maybe we should dis discuss it quickly. Uh, if we, you know what, let me skip this. It's not that interesting. We discussed a tombstone. Yeah, we discussed a tombstone. And uh, yeah, you, you can look this up. I want to move on to indexes. So that's my plan for, um, my plan for today is to discuss general aspects of indexing. Uh, and then to discuss uh, database tuning, uh, which is going to be a more superficial discussion, but we need it for the uh, homework five. Uh, and next, next week, we will discuss details of B trees and hash tables. Uh, and especially the hash tables may be uh, new, new for you. You think you know, no hash tables until you see extensible and linear hash tables. So an index, we know what an index is. It's just a separate file that's organized in some smart way such that whenever you give it a, a, a particular search key, it will tell you the corresponding value. And the value can be the record or maybe uh, some pointer that allows you to retrieve the record. Notice that key here means something else. It's not the primary key. And if the file is sorted by some key, this is not, the key, not, it's not necessarily the key based on which the file is sorted. This is, this is the index key. Okay, so that's how you should think about, about the index. Now, the value is not, a, it's not, it's not a, like a payload that you return to the application. The value is used by the database system to access something inside the table. And it can be um, one or two things. It can be a pointer to the record. Remember the RID? It can be the RID. It tells you how to quickly get that record. Uh, or it can be the record itself. And that's an important uh, thing. We will discuss this uh, in, in some detail. So there are uh, two kinds of indexes, uh, but they have two different names. Uh, the index can be clustered or uh, unclustered. It's a very important concept. Uh, a, a clustered index is when the, uh, the order of the records on disk is dictated by the index. The index dictates how the records on, on this card are sorted. Uh, unclustered means uh, uh, it, it, the order on, on, of, the, of the records is independent of what the, the index does. There is a second terminology uh, into primary, secondary. And here the terminology is not consistent. Different people use it with different meanings. Uh, the, the, uh, the more standard meaning is a second one, actually. Uh, which is just another name for clustered and clustered. Primary means clustered. Secondary means unclustered. And many people uh, refer to primary and secondary. I mean, when, when they say primary or secondary, they mean clustered and unclustered. Uh, some people, however, uh, use it with, with a different meaning, uh, which mean primary means on the primary key, secondary means on anything else. Okay. So what I want to discuss uh, next, I'm going to postpone the B3 and hash table for next time. I want to discuss this um, important distinction between clustered and unclustered. 
So um, um, clustered means, um, if you think about a B tree, the B tree gives you, uh, is ordered. And, and the B tree, the keys are ordered. If the keys in the table are ordered in the same way, then the index is called clustered. And as you will see, this is a, a huge performance improvement over unclustered. Uh, if the index is, if, if it's otherwise, then the index is unclustered. So here is how to think about it. On the left is the index. And I didn't draw a tree, but you, you have some uh, ideas about search trees. Uh, and you know they're essentially, uh, they're clev they cleverly organized, ordered structures. Uh, so I'm, I'm dropped the clever part, and I just show you here a, a, an ordered structure. So this is what the index does. It tells me for every key, uh, where is the record? And in this case, the, the records themselves uh, are also ordered according to the same key. That's the important thing. Uh, what, I, what I show you here is one block at a time. This is one block. And each block holds two records. This is one record. This is one record. So it's a simple picture, but it actually conveys a lot of, uh, of, of information. Suppose you want to read, um, suppose you want to, to, to uh, answer the query, find all records where the, the, the key value is uh, between, um, between, let's say, um, um, between 20 and, and 60. How do we answer this query? How do you find all the, the records whose key value is between 20 and 60? Let me uh, clean up a little bit. Clearly we start from the index, right? And in the index, uh, what is the first entry that's of interest to us? 30. 30. So somehow we can access this index very fast, much faster than, than accessing the main table. So now we follow this pointer, we get this block, but how do we find the other keys? This gives us 30. How do we find the other keys that go all the way to 60? First down the index. You just go down the index. And it is not just that we, uh, we actually go down, go down, we don't need the index anymore. That's the beauty. We, we, go, we go down directly in the data file. And it's not just that we don't need the index. The important thing is that whenever we get a, a block from disk, all the records on that block, they are useful to us. That's the important thing. Uh, uh, except maybe for the last block where we might have, um, uh, have, have uh, some of the records might not be useful for the query. But otherwise, whenever we, make the, the, we, we pay the cost of fetching a, a block from disk, all the records uh, are, are uh, uh, returned to the query. Compare this with an unclustered index, which looks like this. So let's go through the same exercise here. Let's find uh, all entries between whose key is between um, 20 and 60. Let me be faithful to the other one. How do we answer this query? In the index, we start, what did I do here? Oh, it's, uh, the, the, the numbers are all, all screwed up. Let's, uh, let me erase this. Let's go between 10 and 30. I know it sounds silly, but um, it's, it's a really useful exercise. So what you need to do, you need to fetch every single pointer, right? Uh, so so you, you, now you need to traverse the index. There is nothing in the data to help you uh, figure out where the next record is. You need to, to go down through the index uh, and, and follow every single pointer. So obviously there is a big disadvantage, right? If, if you, um, the thing that I wanted to, to tell you is that, that if this range is too big, then it's actually more efficient to do a sequential scan of the entire data. Instead of reading these records up and down from, from various places, 
it's actually more convenient to ignore the index completely and read the data sequentially. So that is, it is important, um, it's an important no thing to know about uh, the clustered versus unclustered index. The, uh, the clustered index is okay even if you need to read like one third of the entire data or even the entire file. You can still use the clustered index. And if you read the entire file, it's not going to be a savings over, um, uh, over the uh, sequential scan. But if you read, like, let's say, one third of it, yeah, then yeah, you, you, might, you might save uh, a lot of time. With, the, with an unclustered index, it's only if you, if you need to access few, very few records, only then uh, do you win. If you have to access like 10% of your file, you might be actually better off doing a sequential scan than accessing 10% of the file in a random fashion. Can the ID in the index be duplicated? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, um, that's an, uh, an issue that I discussed somewhere, but I don't know where. There are two, two approaches with the uh, ID. You either uh, duplicate the key in the index, and then every key, the value, is just a single pointer, or you have unique keys and then the value, what should it be? And the value needs to be a, a set of pointers because you might have multiple uh, records with that key. And there are advantages. And I, I think I have a slide after B3, so maybe we should discuss it next time. Okay, this is how uh, clustered versus unclustered looks like uh, on a B3. Here is a B3. And underneath are the records. How, look how nicely they point. And if you need to do a range query, then it's obvious what you do. If it's unclustered, then they point all over the place. Now, another important idea that is kind of hard to, to get your, your uh, head around is that the, the clustered index, I mean, let me backtrack. Every unclustered index is a completely separate file. You have the file of the data, and then the unclustered index is a separate file. The clustered index is most often the same as the data file. It's not something else. It's, it's inside the data file. Think about this as, as being together. Uh, and the, the leaves of the B tree, they are the, the, um, um, the data records. OK, same thing about hash tables. If, if instead of a B tree, we have a hash table, then uh, on the right is uh, a primary index. So the, the, the records themselves, they are the entries in the index. On the left, we have a secondary index or, a, a, or an unclustered index. Here we really need the pointers. So here we have the pointers into the records. And actually I do have here, I have two more slides and then we can take a break. I, I do have the discussion. Yeah, this is where the discussion comes. I, I thought it comes later. There are three variations. There are three choices for uh, the value. Remember, every entry in the index is a pair, a key value pair. So we know what the key is. The key is um, the, the, the value that, uh, on which we want to, um, to search in the index. But the value. And there are three choices for it. And the book denotes its value with k star. The first choice is it's a, it's, it's a record itself. This is, when the, this is when the index is clustered. It's only when the index is clustered. So you don't get a pointer, you get the record. The second choice is when um, you have the key and the value is a single, uh, a single record ID. Yes. Uh, couldn't you also do um, a sparse key thing? So if you have like a large key and a good number of record IDs, you um, have a uh, key, uh, then another key, and the record IDs in between have um, you know, are bounded by the two keys. Right. So, so that what he mentioned here is a uh, is, is a notion of the called sparse index. If the index is clustered, so it's a, it's a primary index or clustered then you have the option of skipping some keys. And you can, you can afford to keep in the index only the, the first key in every block. And the others you can retrieve because you read the block anyway. And that's called the sparse index. 
Uh, but the, the distinction here is actually interesting. We should discuss it a little bit. The other option is to have uh, a key followed by a list of RIDs. And I'd like you to tell me uh, what, is, what are the pros and cons of these two choices. And I think I have uh, a slide. Yeah, here, here they are. So uh, if you have duplicate values of, of, an, of a key, then you can either have these duplicates in the index, and then each of them goes with a single RID, or you can, you can consolidate them. You can have a single entry for, for each of them, and then they need to have a list of pointers. So what's, what are the pros and cons? It's not, it's not, it's, they're, not, they're not major advantages or disadvantages, but I think it's useful to have this discussion. First one, I'm looking for 10, I don't know how many are there. Right, and the, 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 the first one, you don't know how many there, there are. And actually, uh, when we start looking into B trees, they are quite subtle. So if, you, if in addition you have to worry about duplicate keys, uh, managing the B trees becomes, um, it's, it's possible, but it's, it's very brittle. You have to be very careful how you program it. What is the, what is the disadvantage with the second approach? We would love to have unique keys in the index. But then what happens here? The number of values are varying, so you don't have a... Exactly. You have, you, then the, the entries in the index, they're variable lengths, uh, which creates another set of nightmares. Now you need to worry about some of them being too big and um, others too small. Good. Uh, any questions? Because I, I, now is a good time to take a break. Uh, let's have a break until 8 o'clock, five minutes. And then we'll discuss uh, um, some initial discussion on, on B trees, and then we do database tuning. OK, five minutes break.
Okay, so hello, hello folks. Um, bee trees. So um, I'm not going to go too much into details. Actually, the details are not, not that hard, but uh, I'm going to skip them today. But I, I do have a few slides just to uh, discuss the basics. Uh, so a bee tree is a search tree. Um, how many people know what a binary search tree is? Can I have a show of hands? Good, because it's actually a prerequisite for this, for this class. Uh, that's by, you know what a binary search tree is. We do not use binary search trees uh, to index uh, um, tables and databases. Why not? What's wrong with binary search trees? Too many blocks. Sorry? Too many blocks. Too many blocks? Uh, in what sense? You have to do a whole bunch of reads to get down to the bottom of the tree. Exactly. The, the depth of the tree is where well, it's logarithmic which is good, but it's not good enough for uh, disk accesses. I'd like to think about this, th this way. Uh, when, when you traverse a tree, a binary tree, you need, you need to read one, one node at a time when you go down. Reading one node means go to disk, fetch the entire block, and then you access this little node. That's not a good usage of the space on the, on the block, because that block now might contain nodes that are unrelated to my search. The idea in a B tree is to make the node as big as possible to fill out the entire block. So whenever you read a block, you should get as much information from that block that's useful for your current search. That's one way to think about uh, B trees. So these are the B trees. Uh, the node is now much bigger. Therefore, the fan out will be higher. Uh, they don't have two children. They have uh, um, a large number of children. Uh, and the plus in the B trees makes them a little bit more messy, but they, they are more, more uh, useful for databases. What this means is that all the, the, the keys are stored on the leaves. There, there are keys on the internal nodes as well, but those keys are only used for navigation, for the search. They are not the actual payload. It means that in a B plus tree, you always have to read all the way down to the leaves. And the reason is because often the leaves are actually the, the data records. In a, clustered, in, a, in a cluster index, the leaves are the data, data records. So we, we, can't, we, we need to separate the, the internal part of the tree that helps us navigate from the, actu from the leaves where the actual payload is, where the uh, values or the data records are. OK, so uh, details. Uh, the tree is, um, is governed by a parameter which I call here degree, as the book calls this the order of the B tree. Uh, and the rule is that every, uh, every node has a number of keys that is between D and 2D. That's the rule. Uh, and it has a number of, of children that is one larger than the, num than the number of keys. So here is a typical node. It may say, uh, it may have three keys, uh, 30, 120, 240. Remember, th there, there are no values here. These are not the actual keys in the index. They are only used for navigation. And what this says is that if you're looking, for example, for, for a key that's uh, bigger than 30 but less than 120, then you follow this pointer. And if your key is bigger than 240, then you follow this pointer and so on. So that's how you think about a node. It has a, a fixed number of keys, and one more, uh, and the number of children, that is one more, one larger. So that means that the number of children, how big can the number of children be? Are you, are you with me? If, if I can have between D and 2D keys, how many children do I have? Between D plus one and 2D plus 1. Good. 
Uh, and the leaves is exactly the same, uh, except that uh, now every single record uh, is, I mean, the, now the, the pointers, they are either pointers to the uh, actual record or they can be the record them it, itself, which complicates a little bit the math here with the, with the degree. Okay, so uh, here is a typical B3. The degree here is two, which means that every, every, uh, every node has between two and four keys. There is an exception though. The root is allowed to have fewer keys. The root is always allowed to, ha allowed to have up to one key, no matter how big D is. And we'll see next time why, and you probably, probably know why. So now, I, <clears throat> let's see how, how the B3 works. I want to find 40. How do I proceed? What do I do to find the key 40? Of course, we start from the root and we go which way? Left or right? Left. We go left. Now we need to find 40. What do we do? We go to the middle, right? Because 40 is between 20 and 60, so it's right in the middle. And here is 40. And uh, if you look at this organization, it should be right, uh, the, the pointer right before 40. Okay, so I have a little animation for this. We go down, uh, it's because it's less than 80, we go to the middle, and uh, now we found 40. Good, now the discussion I would like to have before we go to tuning is uh, about using the B3, yes? By finding key 40, what if 40 is not there? Yeah, so what happens if we look for um, uh, 45, yeah. for example? Then we, we don't find it. And then it, uh, uh, this is something that needs to be handled by, um, by, the, by the query processor. Uh, if you say select, uh, select a record uh, where k is equal to 45, then during query processing it will look up the index and it will return nothing and then the query processor knows to return the empty set. Yes, or if, if you use it in order to, to uh, verify foreign key constraints, then the query processor needs to say, I can't insert this value. It, so it depends on how this is used. And talking about usage, let's see how we use it. So um, imagine that we have an index on the table people and attribute age. Okay? So uh, the query is this. It says, and let's suppose this index is a secondary index. It's an unclustered index. I don't want you to uh, um, get distracted by thinking about uh, the more subtle primary index. This is just a separate pointer, a separate tree uh, whose leaves are pointing inside the table. How would you evaluate this query? If you are an optimized query processor, how can you evaluate this query here? It's a simple question. It's nothing... Oh, it's actually written here, right? You, 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 don't, you don't use that main table, but you start in, in the index, you start from the root, you, you search for 25, this brings you down to a leaf, the leaf has a pointer, the pointer points it to the record. Is it a single pointer or multiple pointers? Multiples. It's multiple pointers, and why is that? Because age is not necessarily... Uh, it's not necessarily a key, right? It is probably not a key. Okay, uh, what about a range query? Can we use the index for this uh, range query? Sure, how would you use it? You may need to, s yes? So it's not a range really, I guess everything less than three. Oh, it's, uh, it says uh, 20 less than age and age less than 30. Oh, yeah, right. Yes? Traverse down to 20, scan through the index and say 30. Right, traverse down to 20. And this gives you the first pointer or the first set of pointers. And then you, you continue scanning inside the index. And every new key, this is why the, the leaves of the, uh, the, of the index, I, I forgot to emphasize this, they are linked. So we can scan them without going back. 
uh, which would be a detour. Uh, and this, uh, this is how we find all the ages between uh, 20 and 30. Yes? So a lot of databases, if you can't eliminate like 90% of the keys uh, with the index, they usually just ignore it. If you can't do what? If you can't uh, eliminate 90% of your uh, keys, they'll just do it. Right. Scan. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail. So suppose I have, uh, uh, I have, um, suppose you're a Facebook, okay? And uh, this is what, what a manager in Facebook, uh, Facebook users, they don't uh, look up people uh, between 20 and 30. They, they, they don't have the interface to do this. But uh, the, the manager, they would like to see the trend and they would like to see how many people are between 20 and 30. And the optimizer will not choose the index. Why is that? Half the people. Because it's half the people in Facebook, right? Uh, everybody who is on Facebook is in, in this bracket range. You're probably, uh, if you're a little bit older, there might be exceptions. But uh, uh, it, it doesn't pay off. It doesn't, it's, it's much, it's actually more e efficient to read the, the, the data sequentially. There is a rule of thumb uh, that database um, systems people know, uh, which is if, if you have to read more than 10%, I think, of the table, according to, to him, uh, then it is, more, it is more advantageous to do a sequential scan than to use a, a uncl an unclustered or a secondary index. So secondary indexes are only good for point queries. Okay, good. But now let's get back to, to my main uh, point of the discussion, which is this. Uh, we can create an index on a pair of attributes. Let me create an index on, on the name and zip, zip code pair. What does it mean? What, what goes in the index? We no longer have ages, but we have what? We, we, have, we have pairs, name and, and zip. What does it mean? How are, how are they ordered? If I just had names, then they would be ordered alphabetically. If I had zip code, they would be ordered according to the zip code. But now I create a pair, what does it mean? How are they ordered? By name, then by zip code. By name, and then by zip code. Very important to keep this in mind. So now let's examine the queries and tell me if the index can be used and how. Let's take the first query. How would the index be used in order to answer this query? But it's kind of straightforward, no? We start with a pair, Smith and one, two, three, four. Concatenate them, it gives you a single key for this name zip combination. And I will search in the index for the combination Smith and one, two, three, four. Second one. Can you use the index to retrieve um, people who are named Smith? Yes. Forget about the performance issue, but can you use the index? Yes. How? No, you still go with me. Uh -huh. you, pre you pretend that the zip code is very, very small. That, that's how you pretend. And you find an entry. So you start from the root of the tree. Uh, and you look, uh, it's like looking for a key. It's like looking for this. It's like, like looking for Smith. It's <coughs> minus infinity. Okay? With a zip code that's as small as possible. You don't have to store there. You don't have to put minus infinity. You adjust a little bit the search. And this gives you the first entry uh, where anyone is called Smith. And from there, what do you do? It's like a range scan. From there, you continue like, like a range. And you, you read some until you, it's no longer Smith. And then you stop. OK, how do you evaluate this one? Yes? You have to use a sequential scan. You, you can't, you can't, you can't uh, the database optimizer cannot use an ind the index, cannot use this index here to evaluate uh, uh, the query because it's, it's on the second attribute. And they are not ordered by, they are ordered by the name, they are not ordered by the zip code. Put it this way, if you have this alphabetical list of all people ordered by the name, the zip code one, two, three, four, five occurs all over the place. There is no continuous region in the index that contains one, two, three, four, five. 
Very important concept. It's, it's simple, but it's important to keep in mind. Okay, so I'm going now to, to uh, skip ahead, and we will come back to this discussion uh, next time. But I want to go to, da to database tuning. And let me actually uh, start by uh, briefly mentioning how indexes are used in, and uh, created in, uh, uh, in Postgres. So here is an example. The thing I'm going to use is example later on. We create a table V. Uh, it has three attributes, M, N, and P. So suppose you want to create an index on N. That's what you say in Postgres. You create an index, you give it a name, any name you want, and then you say on, v, on Vn. And V2 will be on, on the pair, P, uh, M, uh, Pm. And uh, <coughs> what's this? VVV is on uh, the pair Mn. And you can create index as many as you want. It's interesting, in Postgres, uh, you, you don't specify the in, that the index is cluster when you create it. But you create indexes, and at some point you, you say cluster v using v2. What would that mean? What do you think Postgres will do now? If we say, when we say cluster, uh, when we say cluster v using v2. Yes? Uh, it's going to rearrange the data in the table according to the fields that are used to uh, in index P2. So P first and then M. Exactly. Well, wait, it, it, can, it can't be ordered based on M, I guess, but, but P it will. And then so it will order. That's the important, um, the important um, step. It's going to order the entire table uh, V uh, according to, this, to, to these two attributes, to P and M. Uh, it, it takes a while, so uh, I just um, I, I told you I'm just playing with Postgres these days, uh, and I had to do a clustered index, and it takes um, uh, on 300,000 records. It, it took like half a minute to order them. Uh, if you have a huge table, I expect to take a long a long time here. Okay, so that's the syntax. Yes. If the table V also has a primary index, Mm -hmm. Then that primary key would have created an index by itself. Right? Uh, usually, database system they do create an index automatically on the primary key, and they they uh, if you don't tell it anything, then they they will cluster that index. They will do you, they, they will have a clustered index on the primary key. Uh, but you can override this. You can create a secondary index on some other attribute, and you can say, please cluster on this one. I want it clustered on this. Okay. No, if if M is the primary key in this case, yep. can we have another index on the key of M? Oh, sure. So let, uh, that's actually an important concept. So if you have M is the primary key, uh, so uh, yeah, so what exactly the example on, on, the, on, the, on the slide is uh, applies here. So what would it do? This creates an index on N, which is not the primary key. It's, it's a, uh, some people would call it a secondary index because it's not on the primary key. Um, here is an index on, P, on PM, which means an index on this, this pair. Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah. And finally, when we cluster, uh, we cluster on the, on the combination P and M, where, where the primary key is the second attribute. So there is no, no connection, I mean, there is no prescribed connection between uh, the primary key and how we which indexes we create and which one we choose to be clustered okay so uh, let's discuss uh, let's discuss the letter a little bit in more detail uh, this is part of database tuning this is what you need to do to make your database uh, respond faster to the application uh, and um, we will discuss three uh, techniques for database tuning uh, index selection uh, data partitioning uh, and denormalization. Uh, and let me start with index selection. But actually, before that, I have a nice uh, picture to, to give you a feeling of, of where database tuning sits. There are several schemas, and actually, in the original, um, in the original concept of relational databases, 
people have considered from the very beginning three levels of a, of a schema uh, called external schema. This is what you um, expose to the application. Think of, of, of it as consisting of views. Uh, there is a conceptual schema. That's what we design. This is a, the boy's called normal form uh, or the third normal form. Uh, but on top of that, you might offer the views, which are your, your external schema. And then there is a, the physical schema. This is how the database administrator decides to actually store the data. Uh, and it might not be uh, the result of the, uh, of the uh, boy's code normal form. And also, uh, this might include um, details about how the, the tables are, are stored, uh, details about the in, which indexes are created, um, yeah, and, and, and clustering. So tuning refers to this part, to designing the physical schema and changing the physical schema. OK? So this is where we do tuning at this level here. Where does the application talk? The application sees what? The external schema. Ne is it necessar necessarily the external schema? Is it always an external schema? It can be directly the conceptual schema. Well, what we do, we, we change the physical schema. But wait a minute. If, if we change the schema, if we change the physical schema here, does it mean that we have to rewrite all the applications? No. No. And this is actually, it has a name. The fact that we don't have to rewrite the applications. It, it's called? This is a data independence. This is a physical data independence or, or logical data independence, depending on from which direction you, you look at. We, we can change the physical schema, but the conceptual schema stays unchanged. The conceptual schema is about the logic. It's about uh, what, the application, uh, what the applications need. The physical schema is when we mess around and create indexes and partition tables and uh, denormalize if we prefer to denormalize them. Uh, uh, and there is a separation between the two. The database system will keep track of the mapping between the two and will uh, um, rewrite queries in terms of the physical schema. Good. So um, here is a, the, the definition of the database tuning problem. When you tune the database, you, you don't look just at the data. You also look at the so-called workload. The workload are the set of queries that are being uh, run continuously on the database. Think about them as being, uh, you, take, you take your Java applications or your C-sharp applications, uh, and you extract from these all the queries, all the queries and these applications that are issued to the database. Uh, and you get more information. You get information about how often they are, uh, they are issued, what their frequency. Uh, and you may also need to know, um, so, so you, know, you know the list of queries and you, need, you know their frequencies. And you may also need to have some additional information about the performance goals. Some applications are really critical and you would really like to speed them up. Uh, others are not so critical. Yeah, you don't care so much even if you slow them down a little bit during your database tuning. Uh, and the, uh, the, the database tuning problem says, given this information, the queries, the frequencies, and our performance goals, decide on, on a physical database design. Decide which indexes to create. Uh, decide uh, on the... Um, the physical schema, uh, but it also sometimes you actually have to go um, beyond that. You have, you might have to tune a little bit the conceptual schema. And this really means uh, um, no. You, 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 you sorry. You, you don't you don't modify the interface to ap the application. But you, you this is, is not correct. It's tuning the physical schema. You tune the, you you modify the green part this part here. Uh, but sometimes you have to go beyond that. You have to uh, go inside the applications and uh, do some hacks there to, to, to speed them up. 
At a minimum, you should declare uh, read-only transactions. You, you should de declare them read-only, and this, this by itself might speed up um, uh, some applications. So I, I want to discuss the various database tuning uh, um, um, tasks uh, in some detail. And I'm going to start with the index selection problem. It was a favorite and continues to be a favorite uh, database research uh, topic. Um, and um, what, what the problem says here is it just focuses on which indexes to choose. Uh, you know the database schema, the tables and the attributes. Uh, and you know uh, your, your, your workload, which means queries plus frequencies. And the, the goal is to uh, choose a set of indexes that optimizes this workload. Okay? Um, so here is, here is a trick. Let me see. Um, uh, let me see how to um, ease you into this, into this problem. So imagine, uh, imagine that you have a database and it has maybe uh, like six, six relations, like the IMDB movie database. And you look at the, at the workload and you say, wait a minute, why should I bother about the workload? Let me create an index on every single attribute of every single table. And you know what, just to be sure, let's also create an index on every pair of attributes of every single table. So you always have indexes on pairs, just in case. What's wrong with that picture? Will your application run, run faster once you create all these gazillions of indexes? As long as you don't uh, insert anything ever. That's where it hurts you. That's when you realize that indexes are, are great to answer queries, but they actually hurt you. When do they hurt you? When, whenever you update the database. When you insert a record, the index doesn't help you at all. On the contrary, it takes more time to insert the record because now you have to insert the, the new values in the index. Even if you update a, re a record, you update uh, whatever, the, the account balance. If there is an index on the balances, that index needs to be updated now. Means inserting and deleting in, in, a, in a B3. So that's a trade-off. Whenever you create an index, you help all the queries that uh, could use that index for searching. Uh, but you hurt all the applications that insert or delete from, from that table. Good. So I have here some, some cute problems for you. Let me uh, skip this. Uh, very simple. Uh, problem number one. You have uh, 100,000 queries like the one on the left and 100 queries like the one on the right. And your, our table is this V of M M and P. Which indexes would you create? I'm taking a bit here. Which indexes would you create for this workload? Uh, so we create a, a one on N. Should we do one, one on P2? Why not? There, we don't seem to have inserts. So yeah, uh, clearly this is going to be much less useful. Uh, now, if you have to choose between um, clustered and unclustered, what would you choose? Cluster on the end, of course. So let's see what they write here. Ah, I forgot to ask you the question. Uh, should they be B trees or hash tables? Now we didn't discuss them in details. Uh, what? Uh, there is one thing that the hash tables cannot do that the B trees can do. Uh, range, range queries. Uh, the, hash, uh, the hash table index is well, it's like a B tree index, but instead of being organized as a tree, it uses it, it uses a hash function, and we will discuss it next next time. But the principle is very simple. It applies a hash function, and it tells us it tells it where to go and look up the record. But the hash function scrambles values. That's exactly by, by definition what it does. It, it's, um, it moves them around in a domain. There is no order preserving hash function. Uh, the order is lost. Uh, so whenever you have to do a range query, the hash index will not, uh, will not be useful. Now for this problem, uh, either a hash table or a B3 would be just fine. Problem number two. 
<coughs> ah, so it, this gets more interesting, right? So we have uh, many 100,000 queries like this, 100 queries like that, and now we have inserts. Now, of course, you see, it's hard to decide which one, but um, give me your best guess. Index on N. Create an index on, on N. What about P? Ignore it. Uh, ignore it. You create an index on P, you help these 100 queries, and you hurt all the 100,000 insert, insert queries. Okay, now B of N, would you make it a B3 or a hash table? Of course, a B3. Because we, we need a range query here. Uh, clustered or, or unclustered? Uh, if once it's a range query, the danger that this reads more than 10% of the records on disk is very high. So I, I, would, I would make it clustered if, if, there is, if there is this choice. Well, if you have a cluster index, isn't that going to make the inserts uh, cost more? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. There might be some difference. It might be slightly more expensive to insert in the cluster index. If it's unclustered, just tapped on the end of your uh, table. If it is, if it is un right. So the uh, inserting in the main table is cheaper with an unclustered index than with a clustered index. So yeah, so there is an argument against clustered because inserts might be slightly cheaper. You still have to insert in the in the index itself. But that's fixed size, probably. Uh, well, if it's a B tree, then no, then you it's it's it's, it's complicated. You have to do the, the insertion. But uh, it's still cheaper to insert in an unclustered index than, than in a clustered index. Yes. Sir? Uh, we decided you mentioned not to uh, index the the middle one because there's a hundred queries there mm -hmm. and it would slow down. 100,000 inserts, is that right? Yeah. How, if there's only 100 of those, so how much is that going to impact any inserts? OK, so let's discuss this in, uh, in detail. It's, uh, it's an interesting question. So suppose I create an index on v.p, right? And I help these uh, 100 uh, queries here. But there are just 100 queries. Yes? If I update the index for every single insert. That's a problem. Whenever, whenever there is an insert, there is a value here for P. So this is going to insert M, N, and P. 100,000 times, this P needs to get inside the index. Oh. Yeah, when we do the insertion, we, we, can't, we don't know that it's going to be used so, so rarely. We, have to, we, we must, we must uh, uh, respect the index and insert, uh, insert the value there. If you, if you took away the, the P out of the three values that you were inserting, though, and you had still had a non-clustered index on P, would that still be just as expensive because you'd have to do some shuffling of the what record you're pointing to? So, so what, let, in those I, I want to have this discussion in, in detail. So you're saying remove this? Yeah. Uh, and now the question is, uh, what happens to this index on P? What, what happens? Let's discuss this. What happens actually with the insert? I have a record with three fields, and uh, I'm inserting only two fields. What happens to the p value? It will insert the default. Then. It will insert the default. What is the, de the, the default of all defaults? Yeah. It's null. So if that's the case, then we are lucky. Then indeed, uh, dropping, dropping p from the insert will not affect the, the p index. Nulls are not inserted in the index. Uh, but if you have another default value, then well, that needs to be inserted every time in the index. So let me see, what did I uh, say here? Um, I said unsure. Why, why, why was I unsure? It's not unsure. It's obviously not. You don't want to create the index on P. OK, but what you can do here, what, one thing you can be, no, uh, let me take it back. You, you, this is what you need. Okay, problem three. Now we have three expensive queries. What can you do here? Index on a pair of 
Aha. P smart use an index on a pair, namely P and N. Well, maybe N and P because maybe. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is completely wrong. Index on N and P. Now you might argue that maybe maybe the, the, the P component of the index is not that helpful here because it's an open uh, it's an open interval. But but that that's the main idea behind this example. It's maybe it's not the best example. But the the, the idea is that sometimes you get more, more value by creating an index with two uh, with over two attributes. Yes. We have two pairs of index A, B, and A, C, uh -huh. and we get a query for A. <laughs> Very good question. So you have an index. Let's suppose you have an index on, on MN and an index on uh, MP. And now your query is a selection on just M. Which index will it pick? Uh, it, there is no obvious choice. What database systems do, they actually look at the cost of using that index. Uh, they might know. Um, Yeah, they might know, for example, that in, in the first index, uh, there is only one uh, matching N. While in the second index, there might be many matching P's. And then the cost differs. It's much more expensive to access the second index. So that's how they make the, uh, this, the, the no. this is how they choose which index to use, if to use an index at all. Yes? At this point, you probably just want to see what the actual statistics are in it. Right. What the actual what? Statistics. Right. Yeah, if N can determine like, you know, ninety nine percent then like more P per index than found the life, right? Are, are you referring to her example? Well, basically. Yeah, so definitely you want to look at statistics. Um, yeah, I had this great example that but I for, I forgot to to run the setup. If you go to SQL Server, uh, to the uh, iProj server and you run this query which I need to, how can I, how do I get there? Let me see. Nope. How do I, here it is. Run this query. Select a star from movie. It's one of my favorites. Where year is equal to 1905. Now, movie, just to refresh your memory, looks like this. There is a, uh, the key ID, there is a title, and there is year. And yeah, we do have an index uh, on year. So what, the, what will SQL Server do if uh, this is uh, the query that you issue? The obvious thing. It will use the index, looks, looks up one 1905, and gives you the, the movies made in, in 1905, more than one. There are a few movies made in 1905. And by the way, there is a join operation. Uh, I, we are, we, we are, we'll, we'll do this demo live when we discuss uh, query execution. But now here is the interesting thing. It replaces, and try this, replaces with 1995. I hope you can do this in class, but you, you can try it on your own. What will happen now? No, it's not the same. That's a, you, need, you need to look at the query plan. Do you know how to see the query plan in SQL Server? You click on, on uh, show, uh, you, one of the buttons at the top shows show the plan. Right? Yes? It won't use the index because there are so many more movies. Exactly. It will not use the index. And the way it can determine the, the distinction is because it, it has statistics for every value of year. It exactly what he said, what your colleague said. There, it has a statistics for every value, for every year value, how many movies there are. And it, it, uh, it, it doesn't use rule of thumb. It actually does a hard calculation. How much will it cost if I use the index of 1995? <coughs> well, there are like 30,000 30, movies. I have to read each of them uh, using the index. Too expensive. It's, more, it's cheaper to scan the entire table. So that, that, uh, uh, that's a difference. <coughs> and the other comment I, I uh, uh, 
I had here is that it gets a little bit esoteric, uh, but the, exactly the, the, the exactly this issue, which index to use if you only need uh, m equals five. Uh, exactly the same issue arises with statistics. Uh, database systems that have multidimensional histograms that have uh, statistics on two attributes. Uh, SQL Server does not have multidimensional histograms as, uh, as far as I know, uh, but DB2 has them. Once you have multidimensional histograms, you can estimate the size of the result in multiple ways and you get different answers. It's a very interesting problem. How do you combine those information to get a consistent answer? This is one of the reasons that SQL Server doesn't, uh, didn't want to support uh, multidimensional histograms. Yes? When you say statistics, when is that built? Like, when are the statistics built? Is it like as the query is coming? Or? Uh, no, statistics are always built uh, off offline. So when we do update, does it go ahead? No. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's very important to keep this in mind. We, this is, um, we will have this, this, this discussion towards the end of the quarter. Statistics are histograms. How many people here know what histograms are? Okay, so, so what this means is that you, you, you fix an attribute, like for an index, you fix the attribute year, and then uh, the, the database system decides, or maybe the, the administrator gives a hint, uh, that it should construct a histogram on year. What this means is that for every value in year, or maybe for some ranges, it will count how many tuples there are that have this particular value. <coughs> These statistics, they are critical data structures. They are used intensively during query optimization. They must be very small, uh, and, and especially since they are small, they are not like indexes. When, whenever, if, you, if you were to update the statistics, you need to log the whole thing. You need to log the entire histogram. Database systems don't do this. They uh, allow the statistics to get out of sync with the main database, and they, re -up the, uh, the re they refresh the, the, the statistics uh, at certain time intervals. Uh, it's, not in, it's, it's much more important not to hurt the transactions by asking them to log on the statistics in order to keep them up to date, then, um, uh, th then it is to have the most accurate statistics. Okay, it's, it's complicated. We, we'll get back to this when we discuss uh, the um, selectivity estimation. Right now, we select indexes. So, um, last, my last problem, which index would you select here? I think that's an easy one, right? I don't know why I have this one. It's obvious. What, what do we do? Uh, create an index on P, but, uh, a B3, of course. And what you do with, uh, uh, with N? No insert. So create an index on N2, also B3. Which one should be, um, should be clustered? The first one. Yeah, we, we cluster the first one. So what did I see? What did I see here? Yeah, it's correct. P is clustered. Good. So this is the index selection problem. As you see, it's kind of um, a, a, a black art. There, there is no algorithm for selecting indexes. Actually, database systems now, they, they do have algorithms. This is one of the, the success stories of, of research in database systems. The first, <coughs> the first index selection system was developed at Microsoft Research uh, by Surajit Chaudhuri in the late 90s. Uh, it was, um, the, as a research project, it was called the AutoAdmin. Uh, they started by uh, developing algorithms for uh, automatically selecting the, the, an optimal set of indexes. Uh, and since then, uh, most vendors have adopted this. Uh, I mean, it, become, it became part of SQL Server. It's called the uh, wizard. The, what is, how is it called? Auto tune wizard? Index tuning wizard. In, index tuning wizard. Um, uh, and and uh, um, today, all, all the major, all the vendors, they have some kind of a tuning wizard. Uh, 
I don't know where I got this one from, but tuning wizards also exist. I, I, but I can't point you to one. I don't know how I got this information on the slide. Uh, don't use a tuning wizard for homework five. Uh, do this manually. And your task in homework five is to speed up a query workload 20 times. Make it 20 times faster by choosing indexes. Okay, so how, uh, how do index, uh, indexes, uh, index selections work, actually? Um, it's essentially, it's brute force. Uh, they, they, they take the query workload, and they know how often uh, each query, the frequency of each query. And they uh, just try all combinations of possible indexes on the tables that you can imagine. Uh, they, they try to be smart about this. If a combination of indexes turned out to be bad, they don't try to add more. Uh, so they, they try to re restrict the search space, but otherwise it's a search problem. The, the really cool idea that they had uh, was um, to answer the question, how do you know that a, a com combination of indexes is a good choice? Uh, suppose you create an index on the year attribute and another index on the age attribute. Uh, and you hope that this will speed up queries, this query, this query, and that query. How can you determine this? Well, there is a, co a complicated theory of, of um, estimating the sizes and optimi optimization. But if you use that, then the danger is that you might be correct that the index is useful but the database optimizer won't pick it because the database optimizer was written by someone else. Uh, so what uh, the, the solution they came up with was to modify the API of the optimizer to allow, uh, uh, to allow this, this question to be answered by the optimizer itself. So the new API that they, they had to, to implement on top of the existing optimizer was, assume I have these indexes. Here is a query. Tell me how you're going to optimize it. And based on these answers, they were, be, they, they, they were able to make the, uh, the right choices to determine whether a certain combination of indexes is, uh, is beneficial or not. That was a major, uh, the major achievement, not, not so much the actual search algorithm, which is essentially a, a general purpose search, search algorithm, but this engineering solution to, uh, to a key problem. Good. So um, more, more things about indexes. Uh, of course, you will try uh, multi-attribute keys. Uh, and now you get a sense of when they pay off. They pay off when you have uh, where clauses where both attributes are, um, are being used. Uh, there is something else interesting. Some queries can be answered entirely using the index. And this is a little bit amazing. Um, let me write this query here. Suppose I, suppose I say this, select distinct year from movie. There are at least two files. There is a file with all the years, which is, which is a B3. And there is a file with all the, the, the movies, the main file, the main data file. Advanced query optimizers, they will only use the index. You don't need, you don't need the main file to answer this query. You only need the years. When this is possible, then the index is called the covering index. Uh, sometimes you, you can go even a step further. You can join two indexes. Uh, we and not touch the main table at all, and then they are called covering indexes. Uh, and if you if you really want to be aggressive about uh, uh, database tuning and about index selection, you need to consider you need to keep these cases in mind, these possibilities. That sometimes you create an index uh, which is so powerful that an entire query can be answered by using only the index. It's called the covering index. OK, to cluster or not, well, you know how to think about this. There is no obvious answer. Uh, one thing about clustering is you may create 10 indexes on the table, but how many clustered indexes can you create? 
just one, right? You only have one shot to cluster. That's a problem. If we could cluster on all, all the attributes, that would be ideal, but we can't. Uh, and here is a nice picture. Uh, I think I got it from the book. This tells you the performance of a clustered index versus an unclustered index versus a sequential scan. Uh, I think it's worth it's worthwhile that we spend some time on this. Look at this query here. Select from R uh, all the keys between in a certain range. Depending on this range, I might uh, and we might end up selecting uh, zero percent of the table uh, or one hundred percent of the table. So imagine uh, so this axis represents a fraction of the table that the query returns. Uh, here is the performance of the clustered index. Uh, if the range is, is small, then the clustered index will cost nothing. But then it increases linearly because you need to fetch more and more of the table. At the end, you need to, re to read the entire table. If you were to use a sequential scan, uh, then it doesn't matter how many tuples you return. You, you have to read the whole thing. So independent on on how many tuples you return is the same cost. But if, you, if your index is unclustered, then initially it's very cheap, but then the price goes up, goes up dramatically, because the unclustered index forces you to read the records in, in random order. And at some point, and again, there is a rule of thumb, and I think that's 10%, the rule of thumb says around 10% or so, it's, it's better to, uh, to do a sequential scan than to read uh, uh, th through the index. OK, nice picture. And uh, it's from the book. Good. Um, some thoughts about uh, B-trees versus hash tables. And I have a simple rule for you. Always use a B-tree. Okay? Uh, why would you ever consider a hash table? Uh, why, would you, why, why would one ever consider a hash table? There is a tiny performance uh, benefit from a hash table. It can be um, marginally uh, faster. So if you, if you really have some absolutely critical query that has an, an, an exact selection on an attribute, you might consider a hash table on that attribute. Uh, and the, the, the second case we shouldn't read now. It's, it's, it says the same thing, that if you have a selection, if you have an exact selection on that attribute that's really critical, then you use a hash table. Uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, every index helps queries, and it hurts updates. So um, that's a balance. This is why index selection is so difficult. No ma magic bullet. This is why we have uh, auto-admin and all these index selection wizards. Tools again, I think we said this already. Good. So, so far, we discussed only one aspect of database tuning, which is index selection, which is kind of the, the most obvious and most important one. I want to walk through two more. Uh, one is denormalization, and the other is horizontal vertical partitioning. Uh, we discussed already ver horizontal vertical partitioning. I only want to refresh your memory. Uh, and, but let me start by discussing denormalization. It's a very simple idea. Here is a nice database schema, normalized in voice code normal form. Uh, every product has a key uh, and has a uh, foreign key into the company ID. And here is a typical query uh, that you can, should expect from such over such a normalized table. Uh, what does it do? It finds all Ah, it finds all products manufactured by, 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 by a company in, in city blah. So it expects a city and then finds uh, all the products and it also expects a price. It finds all, 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 all products uh, with, um, below that price that are manufactured by the by company in city blah. Okay? It turns out this query is really critical for you. The, the, the application that uses this query, this is like, the, like your, the cash cow of your company. You, it has to be very, very fast. What would you do to it? How can you speed it up? 
with the CTN products? Move CTN products, right? Uh, uh, clearly, uh, of, of course, the indexes. I, I, that, that's given. Uh, you can move the CTN product, and that uh, would speed it up. But you can go all the way through. Uh, you can compute the join. Why not pre-compute the join between uh, um, product and company? Which means that the city also goes into that table. And you also have the company name, if you need it. This is called denormalization. That goes again, exactly against what we learned when we normalized. If this is a, the, the, the table you start with, why is this not a normal form? How would you explain quickly that this table is not a normal form? You should not design such a logical schema. There is a, a, a functional dependency that is not coming from a key. The key is right here. It's a product key. But there is a functional dependency which is not from the key. Uh, it's actually not, uh, not very clear. But suppose the company name is unique. The yes, then, then the company name uh, will dominate the city. Why did I use? Uh, oh, because I eliminated CID, this is fine. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't include CID. I should have included CID to make it clear that it's not, not a normal form. However, for the physical schema, it's OK. The logical schema will see the same two tables, but the physical schema will see, uh, uh, will, will see the, the, the normalized table. Now, what I wrote here actually is, is not what, I, what I'm preaching. Um, here, I said that we should, um, no, let me see. I think I said, said this on the, next, um, on the next slide. This is kind of the wrong way to do it. You don't want to ask the application writer to go back and modify the query. No, don't do this. You, you could do it. You could modify the query, and then everything works fine. But uh, you shouldn't do this. What would you do instead? What's a better design? What's a better way? What is actually not, not a better way? What is the standard way to uh, modify the physical schema without affecting the logical schema? Create views. So which one will be the, the table that's being stored, the create table, and which one, which one is the view? The denormalized table is stored. The denormalized table will be stored, and then the individual table will be used. Exactly. This is what we store, and these will become the views. Can you also stick the denormalized table in the reporting database and then leave the uh, transactional one alone? Ah, that, that's another possibility. If you have this option, then that's what you should do. Then you, you, you make a copy of the denormalized table into a separate database, which is your reporting database, where you uh, have to run these critical queries, uh, if, if that's an option. The, uh, the scenario I, I want to consider here, just to illustrate the, the the view concept is that we, um, um, this, is a, this is our only database. And then you have to define views. So uh, some discussion. Yep, it's no longer in uh, BCNF uh, and because there is this functional dependency. But unfortunately, I forgot, I forgot to include CID to have the functional dependency. Um, and all the bad things happen, right? All the update anomalies now happen. Uh, you want to modify a company, you have to modify it in all the products where that company occurs. Um, so, yep, you can do this. Uh, you need to compensate for, for this. Uh, but let's see a little bit views and, and discuss again query optimization. OK, so here I prescribe in gory details how to uh, get there. So you create this new table. Uh, you insert into it. Then you drop the old tables. Uh, and you create views that uh, are substitutes for the old tables, OK? And now you run the query. 
And what happens? So let me see, do we, do we have, does this actually happen here? Yeah, so now I did include CID. I forgot about CID initially. Okay? So we run this query, what do we get? Will this query now run much faster? Tell me what happens behind the scenes. It will query the denormalized. It will query the denormalized table. How exactly? Look at that product, what, we, what will it do with product? We substitute it with, uh, well, let's see what product is. Product is, is this thing. So it's going to substitute product with select uh, something from a product company. What's going to do with company? It's going to substitute it with select uh, something from product company. So we were hoping to avoid the join. It's a join that is it's what we wanted to avoid. Did we avoid the join? It's back in, right? Because now we are joining the same table product company with itself, right here. Is that thrown away by the optimizer? That's, that's a question, but now it's a, if I think about this, how would the optimizer know? It sees the physical schemas. Nothing tells it that uh, that one product, oh, it can... It, well, you're going by a uh, unique key in the same table, right? Well, I know for sure that Postgres doesn't optimize it, but now I'm confused to explain why it should be optimized. Uh, clearly, we want CID to be, uh, to be a foreign key, right? Uh, but it can't be a foreign key because it's not a key. So I, th I think we have a problem with this. I know that Postgres does not, um, does not optimize it. And I said that SQL Server does a better job. This is something that we need to check for next time. I, I, I did spend a lot of time on this query, but this was a couple of years ago. Uh, now I, I, don't, I, I can't really explain how, how it actually can do the optimization. I would have to, we would have to uh, revisit this. So let's do it, this for next time. Can you, can you try to see if this query gets optimized? What, and what you have to do to get, uh, to get the optimizer to optimize it? You have access to SQL, to SQL Server. You're going to play with database tuning anyway, but you're going to do this in Postgres, but it's much harder. The optimizer in Postgres is much weaker. Uh, you don't have to do this particular query. Um, we reduce the, uh, the only tuning you need to do is uh, select indexes. But it's fun to play with this query as well and see if uh, the optimizer can handle it. Good. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the last two um, physical tuning task that I wanted to mention, actually to review because we already discussed them, uh, are horizontal partitioning and vertical partitioning. Uh, what is horizontal partitioning? I have a table. What does it mean when we say I, we are partitioning this table horizontally? N rows are in one table and N plus one to X rows are in another table. N rows are in one table, and then plus one to the end rows are in another table. That's exactly what it means. It's like partitioning the table horizontally by rows. Uh, here is one example. Suppose we have a table product, and um, um, we can partition it by putting all the cheap products in one table and all the expensive products in a different table. That's one, one horizontal partition. Uh, so here they are. We insert uh, into cheap products all the cheap products, into expensive products all the expensive products, and then we drop products. Uh, and then we need to recreate the product uh, as a union of the cheap and the expensive product. And you remember the discussion that we had in use, right? Now, if you query, if you query this, 
what happens? If you look for a product that has price two, what will a good optimizer do? Which tables will it touch? No, it will touch both of them. Because if you look at this definition, there is nothing in, in, in this definition that tells you that the cheap products are cheap and that the expensive products are expensive, except the English, uh, the English description of the table name. So, big problem. When we do physical tuning, of course, we want to get the best performance. We must convince the optimizer to do the right thing. And, um, and you can do this in two ways. Uh, things we actually tried out uh, two years ago when we designed this. Uh, one is, uh, when you create the view, uh, this is what I showed you during in the, in the views, um, in the lecture about views. You add, uh, you add this useless uh, predicate. It's useless, but it, it is a hint to the optimizer that everything that comes from cheap product is indeed cheap. And everything that comes from expensive product is, is indeed exp expensive. Uh, SQL Server does now the right optimization. It figures out that it, it only needs to touch the one of the two tables. Postgres doesn't do it. I was never able to convince Postgres to optimize uh, this query. It shows you the limits of, of today's optimizers. I'm pretty sure DB2 will also do a good job. Uh, and I doubt Oracle will do a good job. Yes? So it doesn't Oracle allow you to do this just by explicitly saying, here's a table, partition it by this predicate head, uh, leave it as uh, basically not having to mess around with the views at all? Sure. So I should mention this. So, so uh, partitioning is normally, you, you would not do this the, uh, in the way I'm describing it. I'm, I'm trying to, to, to show you here the, the concepts behind partitioning. But um, um, commercial database systems, they have a special uh, commands for partitioning the tables, and then they, they, they know how to handle the partition, partitioning much better. Um, but for our discussion, uh, assume that you have a database system that um, only understands views, uh, and you, you should be able to do your physical tuning uh, by just exploiting views and a, a good optimizer. Uh, and it's not always easy to get a good optimizer. Here is a second way in which you can do it. You can specify in the, when you create a table, you can do a check. You can uh, um, essentially communicate to the database system that all the prices in the cheap product are cheap and all the prices in the expensive product are expensive. Uh, and it turns out that if you do, I don't know what, what, what setup in Postgres, and you can could, could get this to work. So you can even uh, get this to work in Postgres. Okay, um, so updates, uh, remember that updates through views are not always possible. Um, uh, for example, now if you want to insert into product, the system wouldn't know whether to send it to a cheap product or to an expensive product. And uh, in order to solve this, you, pr you probably need to define a, a, a trigger. By the way, on this homework, on homework uh, five, uh, you also need to define some triggers in Postgres. Uh, please read the documentation of Postgres, or actually start from uh, from the book. Uh, chapter, I've forgotten, I think it's five. I think chapter five in the book has a document, uh, describes triggers, and you can use these triggers in, in, in Postgres. Okay, so let me skip the rules in Postgres. And I have just a, a few a few slides on vertical partitioning. Vertical partitioning is like this. We partition based on attributes. Same thing, database system, they, they, um, have special, they have special commands for vertical partitioning, but the game we play here is to do this through views. And um, yeah, how do you reconstruct the product? Well, you have the two partitions and you join. And, and now, uh, if you have a query that only touches attributes from one of the two partitions, then uh, normally an optimizer should be able to optimize this. Uh, and here I have only one, one correction to do with, where is it?
one of them, uh, one of the slides refers to a, uh, it's an old slide that refers to a project which you don't have to, uh, which which doesn't apply here. Your, I think your your figure is out. So, um, so SQL Server does the right thing. It will minimize the query uh, by by exploiting uh, keys and foreign key uh, dependencies. Uh, and I was never able to convince Postgres to do the same thing. Yeah, I don't know what happens to. I think part of the slide might be missing. Okay, so you can ignore this. Uh, other stuff you will find on the slides, which we don't discuss in class. It's, uh, uh, I have about 10 slides on security in SQL. One of the questions of the homework asks you to create permissions for, uh, uh, for a certain database. Uh, feel free to use these slides or the corresponding chapter in the book, or, or you just read the documentation. Uh, and that's it. That's all I, I, I uh, wanted to cover today. Next time I want to discuss B3s and um, uh, hash tables and then to move on to query execution. Any questions or other comments? Good, then have a good week and I'll see you next Monday, Wednesday. Just thank you for clarifying. Oh, yeah, no problem.